I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Ibrance or Paclocyclob. This is a medicine that is used to treat advanced or metastatic breast cancer in postmenopausal women whose tumors are positive for hormone receptors. It was originally approved by the Food and Drug Administration for women with metastatic breast cancer in February 2015, and then it got additional licensing in 2016 for women with advanced or metastatic breast cancer who were postmenopausal, whose disease had progressed after initial endocrine therapy, after therapy with letrozole or with tamoxifen. Well, this is the number one prescribed oral drug for metastatic breast cancer right now in the United States, and it's given in combination with either another oral drug known as letrozole or Femara or other aromatase inhibitors, or alternatively, it's given with the injection of Fazlodex. The drug got through the FDA on accelerated priority application and is breakthrough therapy, which sounds very impressive, but it might not be quite as impressive because those are designations that the company actually asks for. Currently, it's important to realize that there is no cure for metastatic breast cancer we can prolong the progression-free survival, the time it takes for the disease to get worse. We can delay the need for additional chemotherapy, but at least at the present time, the disease unfortunately can't be cured. Now, the drug is only for women who have hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative disease. Fortunately, that means it includes about 70 or 80 percent of all women who have breast cancer. So this appears to be the most responsive type, and it's the most frequent type. Now, the testing for this hormone receptor positivity, there's some variation in the way it's done, the way it's reported. So a test could show that a woman is positive or negative for the hormone receptor. Or it could be that the report comes back 10% positive, 30% positive, 50% positive, and, and it's difficult to know exactly what any of that means. But that's the initial hurdle into getting into therapy. Now, the determination of hormone receptor status is done locally on the tissue. It's not a blood test. It's a tissue test from the biopsy or from the excision, from the surgery. The drug is taken once a day at the same time each day, and it's taken with food. If a person takes the drug and vomits, then you don't take another pill. You swallow the whole pill, you don't crush it, chew it, or open it. It's what's known as a kinase inhibitor, and it seems to be very sensitive to the amount of acid in the stomach. So if you take it between meals in a fasting state, there's not going to be a lot of acid in the stomach, and the pill won't be absorbed. You have to take it with meals so that you make some acid. You take the drug for 21 consecutive days each month. You have seven days off. A month is considered 28 days, so then you repeat the cycle. If a person can't take, can't tolerate the full 125 milligram dose because of some side effects, then there are some alternatives. There's a 100 milligram dose and there's a 75 milligram dose for those people who have side effects. It seems that about a third of the people who take the drug are going to require a lower dose because of side effects, and 10% of women are not going to be able to take the drug because the side effects are just too severe. Now, it's only for postmenopausal women. If a woman is still ovulating, if a woman has not gone through the menopause, then this drug is not appropriate. However, if a woman does have advanced or metastatic breast cancer and still has ovarian function, we can use some injections of either Gosserline or Lupron or drugs in that family and make the woman postmenopausal. Obviously, it's not for pregnant women. So women who are pregnant, not even a consideration. Women who are breastfeeding, not a consideration. But if you happen to have mild to moderate liver malfunction, it's okay. You can take the same dose. If you have severe liver disease, well, that would increase the concentration of the drug too much in the system because you can't metabolize it. So that's a definite red flag. Kidney disease seems to be okay to take the drug. Now, the drug has side effects. 
all of these drugs have side effects. You see the ads and it looks like women are just going about their normal business, but, but that might not be exactly what happens. When women take eye brands, the white blood cells responsible for fighting infection fall and often fall quite dramatically. So we have to monitor the blood count before therapy and then halfway through the therapy, halfway through each month worth of therapy for the initial several months to see how the woman's going to react to the medication. Seems like the white blood cell plummets around day 15 of the cycle and stays low for about seven days. Now two-thirds of women taking this drug are going to have a pretty dramatic fall in their white blood cells and it's on the basis typically of this fall in the white blood cell count that we have to lower the dose. But there are some other side effects too. It causes anemia in about a quarter of the women, lower platelet count in about one woman in six or seven, platelets obviously important to stop bleeding, causes infection or is associated with infection in maybe half of the women. Fatigue is extraordinarily common and then 30 percent of women are going to have nausea, diarrhea, hair loss, sores inside the mouth. About 15 percent of the women are going to have vomiting, rashes not infrequent, change in the appetite, just don't feel well, fever, abnormal liver function, blurred vision, signs of infection. Infection that could lead to fever or chills or pale skin sometimes shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, cough, but sometimes the shortness of breath and difficulty breathing in the cough may well be due to pulmonary embolism, blood clots in the veins that get into the lungs. That's another possibility. You have to be careful with other medicines that you're taking. So if you happen to be taking a drug like clarithromycin, an antibiotic, certain HIV medicines, antifungal medicine like ketoconazole, or even if you're drinking grapefruit juice, any of those are going to significantly increase the quantity or the concentration of the eye brands in the system. So it may well be appropriate that you have to cut down on the, either the amount of the eye brands or get rid of some of those other kind of therapies. And on the other hand, if you happen to be taking Tegretol or if you're taking Rifampin, then those drugs are going to significantly lower the concentration of Ibrantz in your system. You should not take Ibrantz if you're taking St. John's wort. And you have to be careful if you're taking fentanyl or dilantin or phenytoin, a very commonly used drug for seizures. There are a variety of other drugs that might interact. Now, this kind of therapy is a drug and it's a therapy so we can call it chemotherapy but it certainly acts different from traditional chemotherapies that are used to treat a variety of cancers including breast cancer. Most of the traditional therapies block either the synthesis of the DNA or cell division. This medicine, a CDK4 and 6 inhibitor, actually works to prevent the cell from going into the cell cycle. And because the cell doesn't enter the cell cycle, it doesn't even get to the phase where synthesis of the DNA or replication of the cell is possible. So that's the way this kind of medicine works. Now fortunately, it doesn't seem to negatively affect the heart. There's some question about one of its competitors, Kiskali, whether it prolongs the QT interval, whether it leads to arrhythmias, and because of that, in Kiskali, not with Ibrantz, electrocardiograms are necessary. Now, the drug is pretty well absorbed as long as it's taken with meals, typically a high-fat, high-calorie diet, gets to a steady state in about eight days. And when it's taken on a repetitive day basis, then it seems that the amount of the drug in the system is about two and a half times greater than it would be if you just took a single pill. Now they have several studies evaluating how well the drug works. The, one of the first studies was known as the Paloma II. It was an international study and what it did is it looked at Ibrantz plus Letrozole, Letrozole remember the aromatase inhibitor versus the Letrozole 
by itself looked at postmenopausal women, remember, who have the hormone receptor on the surface, they're HER2 negative, these women have advanced or metastatic breast cancer, they had pretty good clinical status. All of the women had metastatic disease, basically 97%, visceral disease 50%, bone disease quarter of the women. And the study evaluated what happened with these women. Now, unfortunately, the studies are relatively short, so we don't know long-term survival. We do know that 20% of the women died while on therapy. It seems the combination of Ibrantz and Letrozole reduced the likelihood of a progression of the disease. So women on therapy receiving both the Ibrantz and the Letrozole, 44% of them had progression of the disease. The disease got worse while they were on therapy. But if we look at the women getting the Letrozole by itself, 60% of them had some sort of progression. And if we look at the time it took to get to the stage where there was progression, well, it was 25 months in the women who were receiving the combination therapy, the Ibrantz and Letrozole, versus only 15 months in women who were receiving the letrozole by itself. So it sounds like the combination prolongs the progression-free survival. So that is good. That's something that we want. Unfortunately, the study wasn't long enough to tell us, to give us information about overall survival. And we sort of are more interested in overall survival than just simply progression-free survival. So then they did a Paloma 3 study and they looked at Ibrantz plus Phaslodex versus the Phaslodex by itself and they had all the same rules and regulations to get into the study. Death occurred during the study in 11% of the women, and again, the study wasn't long enough to determine whether it increased overall survival. But again, the time to progression, well, it was much longer in people receiving the combined therapy than in the Phaslodex alone, 10 months versus 5 months and the percentage of women who had some advancement of the breast cancer while on therapy was lower, again at 42 percent, versus about two-thirds of the women receiving just the Phaslodex alone. So it would appear on the, at least the initial studies that progression-free survival is increased overall survival, no good information. Now the question is, is the Food and Drug Administration lowering its standards? Is it accepting this progression-free survival instead of overall survival? Because after all, you want to know if you're going to live longer. And that's a major problem. And at least at the present time, there's no evidence that these new therapies, whether we're talking about Ibrantz or Bersenio, Kiskali, there's no evidence at present that the drugs prolong survival. And as a matter of fact, the women who are in the studies appear not to be typical of all women in general with breast cancer. The women seem to be healthier and somewhat younger. And as a matter of fact, we know that a lot of cancer therapies that are approved later on after they've been on the market for a while prove not to be very effective. Well, in the initial, the Paloma 2 study, they looked at 666 women. And these women were from all over the world. They were from Australia and Canada and Hungary and Germany and Ireland. And they were from Russia and Ukraine and Poland and Taiwan. And we say, well, are the standards the same? Interestingly, the top site for enrollment was in Russia with Ukraine coming in a third. So one has to be a little bit careful about how we accept some of these statistics, especially when the company, Pfizer, they seem to be intimately involved in collecting the data and the steering committee had representatives from the company and they excluded certain women with certain kinds of disease. 
Well, there are some interesting questions. And it appears that in the Paloma study, there weren't really reports on the quality of life. Now, if a woman's taking the medicine, how do we tell whether the woman is responding? Well, at the present time, we have to wait several months, two or three months. Then if a woman had some sort of a disease that we could measure, we could do another scan. And then we could see if the tumor was shrinking. But interestingly, just recently, the Medical Research Council from the United Kingdom, they potentially have a test that will allow earlier detection to see whether the drug is working. It would appear that therapy probably delays progression of the disease by about 10 months. But as far as overall survival, Dr. Richard Finn from UCLA, who was one of the original investigators, he said that there's, at least from the Paloma 1 study, that wasn't really designed to show overall survival, but that's the only study that looks or that has enough women and has enough time. And it seems to show that there's no significant difference in the overall survival among women taking the drug versus women who were receiving just either the FAS, the DEX, or the Lectrazole. The overall survival, in spite of the fact that we had almost a doubling of the progression-free survival, the overall survival might have increased a couple of months, perhaps at best. But that's what happens when we have all these accelerated approvals going through the FDA. Now, Dr. Vinny Prasad, who's sort of a commentator on drug therapies for a variety of different kinds of drugs, he says that most of the studies analyzing a link between the progression-free survival and overall survival are very weak. And even the American Cancer Society's major official, Dr. Otis Brawley, he says progression-free survival is just a guess as to whether the therapy actually works or not. And he says that if you approve a drug based on the progression-free survival, just like uh, this family of drugs, iBrain specifically, well, we don't know if it does anything positive for the f patient. And when we talk about progression, if a tumor doesn't grow by more than 20%, does not grow by more than 20%, so it could grow 10% or 15%, then we assume that that's not progression. Well, the drug was looked at in several other countries as far as putting it on the national formularies. In the United Kingdom, the regulators said, it costs too much in regard or in relation to the potential benefits that we get from it. It's not cost effective. And if you want to get it on the market here, you have to decrease the price. So they had a little fight in Germany. In 2017, the German Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare, they assessed the drug and they said the benefits aren't really proven. And they said that the company presented data and the data really didn't have any relative difference in the health status as far as the morbidity was concerned, the health-related quality of life. They said that the company wants this progression-free survival as a surrogate for overall survival, but that's probably not appropriate. And the National Center for Pharmacoeconomics in Ireland evaluating the drug said it's much too expensive for the benefits that women receive. So they didn't recommend it for reimbursement even though Pfizer offered the drug free because they wanted it to get original status, free status. They wanted it to be on the market in the United Kingdom. Well this drug's a big money-making source. That's why you see ads for it all the time. In 2015 it brought in seven hundred thousand dollars. By 2016, the number was over $2 billion. In 2017, it was over $3 billion. Now, it's made by Pfizer, and Pfizer is big pharma. Big pharma. What does that mean? Well, in the case of Pfizer, its revenues are about a billion dollars a week. The company makes $52 billion in revenue 
Now, what does that really mean? We talk about these billions. What, they mean, what it means is that every day the company has sales of about $140 million. Every day, $140 million. Their profit is $21 billion. What's $21 billion? Well, it's $21,300 million. That's how much this company brings in. The cost of the drug to you if you paid cash and you bought it in 2015 would be about $128,000. That rose in 2017 and now it has gone from the $128,000 in 2018. Now it is about $150,000. And if you plunk down cash, that would be $547 a day. $547 per a day for a drug that delays progression-free, it, it, it increases the progression-free survival. It increases the time it takes for the disease to progress, but it doesn't seem to change the overall survival, at least according to currently available statistics. The companies advertise it as a wonderful drug that allows women to go about their normal business, and in some women certainly it does, but in other women, there are significant side effects. It's certainly very expensive. Costs, as I say, 500 plus dollars a day. And what we need to do is we need to perhaps advance all of the money that we're spending on therapy and maybe we need to redirect a certain portion of it to consideration of what the real underlying cause of breast cancer is and deal with some of the mechanisms involved so hopefully we can prevent the disease rather than treat the disease and hopefully we can find some partners in the drug companies that seem to be making an awful lot of money on the basis of their therapies. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.